Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Bucks UK TV. It's episode 158, and Gary, Rich, and Sam are joining me this week. Sam, all the way from the pirate ship, I can see. Uh, <laughs> we were just saying how much we love overtime on late games, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. Be feeling <laughs> the effects in work today. Uh, I've got to admit. So obviously, for our friend stateside, that was a nine-ish kickoff. Uh, which was running, you know, slow running game. By the time we got an extra 40 odd minutes out of it, it was uh, quite early in the morning. Rich, I guess the thing that's on everyone's minds, just how lucky were the Bucks last night? Uh, I mean, when you take into account that the Panthers missed two field goals in regulation, and as well as managing to force the fumble in overtime, I think it's um, fair to say pretty lucky, but I also think we've been due a little bit this year, considering we've lost two games in overtime without ever actually touching the ball. Obviously, it's a bit of a shame that the Panthers did have the chance to touch the ball in overtime, but nice to see that it it did bounce our way finally this year after what feels like it's it's not. And obviously, there's the Adam Thielen touchdown just before half, which I think is pretty lucky that didn't get called a touchdown <laughs> in the end. Um, but... Sometimes you need a little bit of luck and good teams can sometimes win when they don't play so well. So it's nice to see that we've turned that corner a little bit. It's a good point. And there's plenty of times in the past where, you know, the Bucks lose lots of games by less than a score. And if you know what the difference one touchdown a game makes, it, um, it, it clearly could turn things around. Sam, let's start talking about the offensive side of the ball. I think for me, that was probably the more interesting one. Last week, when we had your sister here, uh, we were proclaiming shutouts, 31 nil, 41 nil. Uh, it didn't quite turn out that way, did it? Yeah, I um, I know that when you spoke about your magic wands for the game last week, Mariana mentioned that she wanted to wave her magic wand on the O-line. Mm. Um, and I think that was one of the things for me that, that especially on the interior O-line, they were a little bit poorer. And we'd have four sacks, six QB hits. It was definitely one of those games where Baker was in a, f- facing a lot of pressure. Um, obviously, came away with the ankle injury, which is something to monitor really f- next week. Very uh, definitely concerning. Um, but I think that limited our ability to make those big plays. Um, we ended up having to rely a lot on our on our running game, which fortunately for us, we have one now this year. Um, but yeah, we were relying on a young rookie to really pull us out of the bag, I think. Yeah, it's true. And Gary, uh, Sam started talking about the O-line, so let's stick with that. There seems to be a bit of a Graham Barton snap on the bum thing going on. Well, um, he had a few problems, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, game, a couple of bad snaps, a couple of penalties. Um, but then he got his act together in the second half. And and they remarked on it in commentary, actually. The, that O line is playing really well together now. Um, a real bonus to get Worths back. He was amazing uh, last night. And you know, even if he's 60, 70 percent or whatever he is, he's still better than anything else we've got. So I thought the O line played really well. And and if the O line play, plays well, you get a good running game as a result. And and look what we did running wise, two hundred two hundred and thirty odd yards. Yeah, I think I think in Sam's defense, he's probably talking about pass protection. There was yeah. uh yeah, I think I think yeah, you're right. Run blocking historically hasn't been a real strength of the Bucks, no. but um yeah, clearly they are finding ways. But dare I say it, Rich, I feel like it's also because our backs have suddenly learned to be a bit more patient. Yeah, I, I mean Bucky is just I mean Bucky, the, Bucky. yeah, I mean, the first guy <laughs> just never brings him down. I was I was a little bit Disappointed that we didn't see more Sean Tucker last mm. night. Well, we didn't. Any. When I say more. I say <laughs> yeah. When we when I say more, we didn't see any of him. And particularly when Bucky got hurt, I thought mm. late in the game, fresh legs might be a good time to potentially give him a run out. Obviously, I know he fumbled last week, but so did Bucky and so did Rashad. So you would have thought that. It's, I feel like, I feel like he got put in the doghouse a little bit too quickly. Um, although talking about the O line, I do think that I saw. Um, I think it was Reg Orman tweeted that. Um, the, there was only six pressures actually given up by the offensive line and no, no sack was actually because of the offensive line. It was all attributed to Baker holding on to it for quite a long time last night. So <laughs> I do think that like the offensive line were, they did about as well as they could. But I think obviously there's been lots of talk about Baker getting rid of the ball so quickly this year. But last night was one of those times that he didn't seem to do that. It it looked like it was Mike Evans or potentially a sack was which is what he was looking to for quite a long time. But um, yeah, the the running back particularly. It's a shame that Rashad White didn't get involved in the pass game a little bit more, but 
um yeah that that run in the right at the end of overtime sort of like showed that I know he's he's had a little bit of stick this year but I still think he's quite special and we we really have got a three-headed monster and we use him correctly yeah it's true Sam what, what do you think about the play calling there I think because they, they, we did seem to be a bit revert to type didn't we yeah definitely um specifically offensively yeah I think so it's a shame not to see more of Kay Dotton as well I think towards the end of the game we started to get him involved in the passing attack a little bit more and that added a little bit more dynamism to our offense um early in the game we were relying too heavily on Mike and that really showed it meant that they could just double up on him at times or put their stars cornerback on him JC Horn um and kind of shut us out of the game yeah it's true so I think Gary we're saying that maybe we're not necessarily slating the offense, but maybe it wasn't firing quite as well. But actually, a bit of credit to the Panthers secondary as well. Then, yeah, the Panthers, you know, did play pretty well. They were certainly fired up for the game. I don't think Liam Cohen called the best game mm. uh, that he could possibly call. I mean, he's still learning on the job, of course. Um, there was uh, a podcast I listened to, Rick Stroud's podcast I listened to, and he cited the 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 first play when Baker came back after the injury was a third and one mm. with no running back on the field. So he's got a gimpy ankle. He's just had a couple of plays off. Uh, it's only a third and one against the worst NFL, you know, the worst rushing defense. And yet we didn't have a running back on the field. Uh, Maybe that's because Tucker was in the doghouse. If it's third and one, to be honest, we saw that with giving the ball to Rashad White. I think I'd much rather give Tucker the ball in short yardage. Well, yeah, as we saw in that uh, yeah. play to, with, towards the end of regulation when uh, mm. when he got stuffed for a four or five yard loss. Mm. Uh, one one thing that I do like though is that Liam Cohen does learn during the game. Mm. Like after, like you're completely right that that third and one, he almost set Baker up for failure there a little bit, mm. but then through the fourth quarter we're we're down but he's sticking with the run heavily and I think we went 14 for 91 yards or something in the fourth quarter alone which is which is pretty impressive so it shows that I although yes I completely agree he didn't have his best game calling a game yesterday but he certainly learns as he's on the job which is great to see because we don't need to talk about him too much but there's been previous offensive coordinators that haven't learned on the job and <laughs> <laughs> have con continued to beat their head against a brick wall so it's nice to see that there is that progression there i think it's a good point and it kind of the game had sort of like an ebb and a flow on that basis because we came out being relatively effective relatively then clearly you know maybe we never know the x's and those and who's what plays are actually being called and what coverage is but then it felt like the panthers adjusted uh, and took a lot of those things away. And then we, like you say, we readjusted at the end um, and it became much more productive. So, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a bad day at the office when you think about the score, but we did need five quarters to uh, uh, to get there. I mean, Sam, the, the the cardiac kids alive and well, how exhausting is quarter five? <laughs> yeah, I think just going back quickly to what you said as yeah. well, I think um, regarding that game flow, I think that's quite similar mm. to if you look at, say, for example, the Saints game where, we totally dominated. Then the second quarter just seemed to forget how to play football. And then, mm, like, mm. so it seems to be that we are exhibiting that quite a lot this season. We're getting found out early, but then adjusting well. So exactly as Rich said, I think it's very good to see we're not in the days of Byron Leftwich or whatever, just banging our heads against brick walls. So that's definitely a positive for me. Um, one and thing then, that was yeah, so go on. I was just going to say, one thing that was frustrating for me, I think, was bizarrely the punting, I think, was this Brian Gill experiment or whatever is it Gill's Trenton, Trenton, yeah, Gill? Trent, Trent, Brian Gill's Gill, the, yeah. uh, the Spurs player isn't he yeah, um, yeah. and they, and they have a, they've got a Gill as well I saw the, the Panthers have as well just to really confuse that's them not, that's our can <laughs> Gill that played yeah. for us yeah. yeah but yeah I saw that statistically now he's the second worst punter in the entirety of the NFL only ahead of a, a punter that was brought up from the Rams practice squad for one week and then cut so mm. that says a lot uh statistically yeah, he's what? just not been performing and that's with some lucky bounces he had last night yeah. what's Jake Kamado up to these days <laughs> I mean much. I was a big Kamado fan and I don't, I, we don't, I we, was don't really, we don't really know what he did wrong do we so we're never going to get to the bottom of that but I don't know it feels like once I've been like fired you know it feels like you know, a bit like Stockholm syndrome if he were to come back again on his part. I almost like I'd offer it to him, but I'd almost think less of him if he took it. Um, <laughs> but I take yeah, I take your point. And actually, it felt like yeah, the return game as well, Rich. It wasn't really there, was it? No, it wasn't last night. 
um, didn't, there's no, even there was one kick, I, I can't remember at what point in the game it was, but I know Jarrett was the one returning it and it was at about the 10 yard line and he barely made it over the 30. Just apart from Money McLaughlin, there really wasn't much to write home about last night in on special teams. And even he missed one, which is unusual. I think that was more down to the snap and the hold, unfortunately, but it's still unusual to see him miss one from any kind of range these days. So just just an off day all round for special teams and, and offence for probably 80% of the game. Um, so as I said earlier, if bad te- or good teams can win when they play badly and maybe we're just starting to turn that corner, hopefully coming, coming down the stretch. Yeah, I think everyone gives Chase a pass. They, well, he didn't miss by a lot and I think you're right. Yeah. It looked like a bit of a slightly... Quick snap, high snap. The the I thought it was the hold first of all, but yeah. I look back and actually the hold. I think the hold did quite well. But, yeah, um, that's the yeah, one thing yeah. that Trenton Gill did do well all night. I think, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was just just didn't time up quite right. And when you're going, was it 55 yard and anyway at that point, it's got to be pretty much perfect for it to mm. to sail through. Um, but no, it, I don't put any blame on McLaughlin for that for sure. Just just good to see him bounce back and make the game winner when he needed to. Speaking okay, about then, kicking, though, you yeah. touched on it earlier, Rich. Obviously, their kicker missed two kicks. Um, so I did a bit of digging on the stats. And kickers against us this season have missed 10 field goals. So they're 22 of 32, which is 68.8% of field goals made. Wow. Rank at the bottom of the league if that was a, yeah. just one kicker. Because Koo so missed a couple against us, didn't he? So yeah, yeah. Koo missed a couple. Moody missed three for the 49ers. Mm. Two yeah. last night for Pinheiro. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the next closest is eight. It's like the Eagles or something like that. I saw the I saw a similar thing going into the game, but it was eight going in. So yeah, obviously ten coming out of it. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. it's been it's been a bad year for, for <coughs> kickers all around, that hasn't it? I mean, Justin Tucker, you know, the best ever potentially is having yeah. a mare of a season. Missed again yeah. yesterday. So three more yeah. yesterday. Mm. Although ironically, was perfect against us in the season where <laughs> it's been terrible against us. So. <laughs> Quality will always out. Gary, let's finish off then with the review part with the um, defensive side of the ball then. Um, it felt <laughs> like... Was there a defence? Well, I was going to start with the positives. I felt like we got good pressure. We just couldn't finish. Um, yeah, but pressure when you get a, 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 a small, nippy quarterback like someone mm. like Bryce Young, you know, who can just wiggle his hips and he's gone. Pressure's not good enough. You need to get him on his backside. And and that just didn't happen. And, and you know, you avoid pressure by rolling out, don't you? And that's what he was doing. Um, even if he's chased out and it's a, a broken play, look at that long play to Tremble down the sideline. You know, chase him out the pocket and, and Tremble stood on his own, as is uh, always the case with opposition receivers. So just standing there the waiting for the ball to come to them. Yeah, I thought defensively, with the exception of that one uh, strip at the end, and even Yaya Diaby tried very hard not to fall on it. <laughs> um, the defense was well. I said on the forum, it's embarrassing. It is embarrassingly bad, and I'm, and I just think that's that's what it is. Pressure is pressure, but but look at the score. It's you know what, probably the second worst team in the league. And we made them look like world beaters. I mean, I don't know about you guys, and maybe it's the pessimistic Bucks fan in me that over the years, but did you have any doubt that they were going to score a touchdown mm. at the end? Mm. Because no, no, I didn't. No. I didn't. No, 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 no. I was just hoping they would do it quickly like they did. So that we'd get <laughs> well, yeah, that helped them. Because, yeah, yeah, better to get 34 seconds left than four. You know, yeah. Yeah, mm. exactly. I, I tell you who does deserve their props, and this is going to hurt me to say it, was... Uh, was the coaching team, and I'll, I'm I'm going to not single anyone out for using their timeouts wisely for a change. Mm-hmm. I was very concerned when we decided to run one last play. I was looking at how much time we had left on the clock, and I was like, this could be suicidal. Um, mm-hmm. But we managed to get those extra yards, and maybe that did make the difference. Yeah, the four or five yards we got, I think, me, it turned it from a risky kick yeah. to mm-hmm. maybe a higher percentage one, didn't it? Mm-hmm. My, myself and my sister, we we in our group chat, we were messaging. We were all like, what are we doing? Ah! We should do this. Oh, great decision. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Hindsight's twenty twenty, I guess. Yeah, that's, I think. And But Sam, do you, in terms of the defensive play calling, you know, do you think we had, it felt like we're, at times we had that prevent bubble defense shell thing that we all roll our eyes about. But it also felt like, I think we at times we shut down the run. 
Yeah, I mean, we definitely got pressure up in Shuba Hubbard's face. I think like that was quite good. He's played really well this season. He's been one mm. of the more consistent runners in the league. So that was good. Mm. Um, but I think Gary's right. For me, I think there was, it was like false pressure. It looked like we were mm. constantly in, in the quarterback's face, but especially for such a young quarterback and one that's dealt with um, issues with their confidence this season being dropped from the team, I'd have liked to have got some early, like an early sack could mm. have completely mm. changed the complexion of the game. And it wasn't until halfway through the fourth quarter that we finally got home and, and actually got our first and only sack of the game. Yeah. So for me, that was the real frustration. I just thought one early sack that could have thrown him off course. It reminded me a bit of the, the Texans game with CJ Stroud last year. Kind of, you know, actually, I was really impressed. A young quarterback that maybe isn't very universally rated across the league came in. I just thought he had a really good touch. There were yeah. so many passes that just went over players. And you don't see that very much in the NFL because the velocity you have to throw the ball at, it's hard to have that touch. I was actually really impressed. I just think there's... <laughs> I, I take your point, but there's so much space to throw it into. Mm. That yeah. and he has so much time to do it, and mm -hmm. I my frustration with the defensive play calling is you don't see TJ Watt in coverage, you don't see mm. Max Crosby as we're going to come on to in coverage. We needed to get a sack early. Todd Bowles's blitzes work well when they catch players out, but Dave Canal has spent a year doing cool at sessions in training camp against Todd Bowles defenses. Yeah. I think he's probably going to have a pretty good idea of what Todd might be doing quite often. And though dropping, I'm sorry, Anthony Nelson shouldn't be in coverage. Yaya Diaby shouldn't be in coverage. Mm -hmm. They're, they're built for rushing the passer. Let them rush the passer. Let's get some pressure and get a sack instead of. I know. Hindsight's 20 yeah. 20, though, because one of them dropped back in a coverage that's not expected and the ball's thrown straight to their hands. We're all well, saying, well, the that's last, fantastic. The last time that happened was Jason Pierre Paul in. 2021 against the Rams, I think. <laughs> and then probably they... Warren sat before that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I just, I I struggled to see the merits of it. I, obviously, against the Giants, it worked well. Mm. But the Giants are the Giants. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough look, I think. Okay, mm. well, Rich, we'll stick with you for the magic wand moment then. You can wave your magic wand over one part of the team or one player. What's the, in terms of the focus for training, the focus for someone mm. that we kind of want to elevate for the, for the week ahead? Not necessarily looking forward to the opponents, but, you know, kind of what what your emphasis would be. I, I think given, it's, it's between Yaya and Levante because mm. we need to get pressure on Aiden O'Connell and we need to stop Brock Bowers. Having seen Brock Bowers torch the Chiefs at, um, on Friday night, I think it was. Yeah, it was Friday night. Um, I have a horrible feeling with without Jordan Whitehead, potentially now without Mike Edwards, if his hamstring's bad, the middle of the defence is going to become very important. So I'll probably go Levante because I think he's going to have to have a game of his life because I know Brock Bowers is a rookie, but he looks like he could be the best tight end in the league. And yeah, yeah, it's a concern. Yeah, we were talking Sam with Poppy last week actually about Levante. And kind of, has he lost a, a, a step or lot? And I, was, I, I haven't managed to go back and watch like all of the all twenty two or anything yet. It's not live yet, but I did watch the uh, the, the game again uh, on the sort of the the game in forty type thing. It looks like you know we're not asking Levante to blitz almost at all compared to, you know, actually his game, he's very adept at blitzing. Yeah. Uh, but because we've got so many, we, you know, we obviously we didn't have um, JTS yesterday, but, you know, the JTS type role, the Yaya's, like I say, we've got lots of people who are much more blitz adept, and I think it's making him more one-dimensional. Um, so I'm kind of maybe cutting him a bit of slack. Yeah, I, I think what I have tried to remind myself, though, is that in our Super Bowl winning run uh, <laughs> under Bruce Arians and in our other playoff run, we did hold back on some of our defensive play mm. calling. We mm. held a little back back behind in the locker. We didn't want to show teams everything we had. And that like worked wonders against the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, but in against other teams in the run-up where we were showing packages that we'd never shown any other team. So they had no way of preparing mm. for it. So I'm I'm maybe it's just hoping like pure blind optimism, but I'm convincing myself at least that maybe that's what they're doing. Well, it could just um, be... Having said that, I thought Levante played really well against the Giants, yeah. so I'll yeah. let him off this week. Mm. Yeah, so I think I just, I don't it's not that Levante's played badly. I just think he's having to make up for a lot of struggles around him. Um so he's he's potentially having to almost try and do more, which is why I think if he's gonna he's gonna have to do the most to stop Brock Bowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we'll come on to that. So, Sam, your magic wand moment and then Gary and then we're done. Uh, so my magic wand moment is 
probably the easiest magic wand of the week, I think, which is just it's all on Baker Mayfield's ankle. I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that we're going to use it as like a splint okay. and tape the wand to his ankle. Yeah, magic wand, magic spray, magic yeah. anything, <laughs> uh, magic dance. I'm doing yeah. it all. Okay, and Gary? Um, yeah, Baker, I think will be all right. Um, the guys have touched on my magic wand, and uh, the point was made earlier that Canales last year was going up against the bowls defence every day in practice. But what's never been, I've not heard mentioned yet is that bowls knows Dave Canales' tendencies in terms of play calling. Of course he did, because he went against him every day in practice. And I don't think bowls adjusted yesterday to that. He, I think he must have known what was coming. But, you know, the defence was horrible. We know that. So my magic wand is Todd Bowles to, as Rich said earlier on about uh, Liam Cohen, uh, learning on the job and improving and changing things as he goes on. Mine is for Todd Bowles to do the same with the defence. And we've got to get O'Connell you know, running for his life. It's as simple as that. Well, maybe as Sam said, there's a couple of pages of the playbook that are just stuck together, the plastic, just <laughs> like static or something. We'll try and get those uh, it, those opened up. I don't know about you guys, but it just baffles me when you, th- when you look at what the Lions do to every team each week and just torch everyone, but yet we managed to hold them to 16 points yeah. and that was masterful. And then it's both teams have just gone in complete opposite directions mm. since that game on those sides of the ball. It, yeah. I mean, not not just the Lions. Look at the Eagles' record as well. They they've not they've not lost yet, have they? Offensively, and we destroyed. Like, just seem to have their number. So, I, I, yeah, the Lions and Eagles both haven't lost since they lost to us. Yeah, yeah. crazy. Broncos haven't lost many since they lost to us. No, uh, since they beat us. Sorry, Commanders haven't lost. Luckily, many. the Falcons have. The Falcons have. <laughs> yeah, that was that was huge. It felt like you know we were all at the six o'clock game. We were all cheering. The little Falcons, oh, well, no, it was perfect. And now we just need to actually win the game ourselves. Yeah. Speaking of which, then, let's come on uh, and talk about the Las Vegas Raiders. That still feels a bit weird in my head. I'm just too old. Um, Gary, um, now the Raiders, it, it, this is an up and down team, isn't it? Um, very much so. And, and you know, we don't really know an awful lot about them, do we? We don't play them very often. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're the other side of the country. You could name two or three of the players, but yeah, you know, I have to look up who who got all their yards, receptions, and uh, in the game on um, you know when they who did they play? Did they play the Chiefs? Chiefs. Mm. They, um, they, held, they they gave the Chiefs a really good run. Yeah, I've only, I've only then, seen the highlights, but yeah. But then so did we. So did Carolina. It's, As, that's yeah. the Chiefs. They they've got to be the worst eleven and one team ever in the history of the <laughs> known universe, but. The point I'm making about the the Raiders is they the running back who got all their yards was a guy called Sincere McCormack. Now, you know, can somebody tell me who Sincere McCormack is? Sounds like I, a gunslinger. No, I, I I'm in a league with uh, with quite a lot of different players. I think there's 26 a fantasy football league with 26 different people, and Ooh. he's still on waivers. So that wow. tells you that tells wow. you all there is about well, there how, how deep down the roster he must be. So, you know, the, the thing about the Raiders is we don't know a lot about them. We rarely play them. And, um, you know, I I just look at the results and uh, and take it from there. And if they ran the Chiefs close, as, as we did, as the, the Panthers did, you know, it depends on which Bucks team turns up. If it's the team yeah. against the Giants, we're going to whoop them. If it's yeah. the team that played the Panthers, um, you know, they're going to, they're going to give us a hiding. So, yeah. So, Rich, let's start with the Raiders' offense then, and how we're going to try and scot them. I and mean, this is a, this is a team that's had some notable departures, hasn't it? So, as we say, in terms of you know, maybe the, the 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 experience, if not the caliber of who we're up against. Obviously, there's no shirkers in the NFL, but at the same time, it's not yeah. Pro Bowl laden. It's not. I think I think Jacoby Myers is a very underrated wide receiver, and mm. if I was if I was Todd Bowles, I would certainly think about having Zion shadow him for most of the game because I don't think there's a lot in their receiving core outside of him. I think they've got a couple of young guys that are fairly big play threats, but you'd like to think if maybe Ty Key's back or Jamel with his speed would be able to sort of keep them at bay a little bit. And then I think it's a case of 
does Antoine take one on one with Bowers or like we, there needs to be double coverage on Bowers on basically every single play. You just can't afford to let him be the one to kill us, which I think we're probably all quite apprehensive about knowing that middle of the field is the easiest place for the quarterback to throw. That's where we struggle the most. We see it. I mean, Tommy mm-hmm. Tremble going five for 77 tells you everything you need to know. So the guy who's leading the NFL in receptions currently is coming to town. <laughs> I think that's a bit of a, a little bit of a worry. Um, I'm not too worried about the running game. I think Vita and um, Kansi and the guys up front can can take care of that. And it, it, as Gary was saying, it just comes back to getting pressure. Just just got to get pressure. I I personally don't want to see Yaya and Nelly dropping into coverage too often. I think I think there's enough tape on those guys doing that now that teams are working out pretty quickly how to beat it. So we just. I think you've almost got to go a little bit old school and just. I'd love to see a bit more man to man as well instead of zone. Um, praying. Oh, I think we. I think we'd all love that. <laughs> we'd all love that. I, yeah, and I. I just hope Although, Mike Edwards' hamstrings a bit better and we get hit because I think him and Winfield when they played together in the hmm. short period in the Giants game in the the first, first what fifteen twenty or so minutes before he went out in the Panthers hmm. game, I feel like Winfield's been a bit more impactful and we've seen more of him. So I just hope that maybe he's he's available as well. Yeah, the one time we were in man against the Panthers, I think it was I had to, to go and look up who's number thirty-seven. It's Tavier Thomas. I was like, turn your head round, man. The ball's coming. <laughs> like, look, and then he, he tried to turn it, he fell over. Anyway, yeah, not not the great highlight reel there. But Sam, I think Rich talked about tight ends. I think that's the 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 Raiders seem to have tight ends coming out of their ears. But like you say, it's clearly only one that's the uh, that, the main one. Um, how aggressive should we be? Because yeah, you know, you you're blitzing the blitzes tend to come from the part of the field where the tight ends will drift into. Yeah, so as I said on the review section of the uh, the, the Panthers game, yeah. I think an early sack would have completely changed the dimension of the game. Mm. And we're facing a similar quarterback who doesn't have that wealth of experience to draw upon. Someone who is still really early in their NFL career. So I'd like to see us start aggressive. I'm not saying we should necessarily stick to that throughout the whole game. You don't want players getting tired. You don't want to kind of over blitz and and leave yourself open defensively but I would like to see a start aggressive I think that's the key thing mm. um, as Rich said you know we were giving up yards to Tommy Tremble he's effectively their third string tight end going into the season I know they've got one injured and Jatavian Sanders was out but we give up a lot of yards to tight ends historically whenever we play anyone I always mm. put a bet on a tight end to score a touchdown against us um, so we really do need to focus on shutting down Brock Bowers um, maybe that is a task for Levante. Who knows? I've got a fun stat for you on Aidan O'Connell that it, he has gone the longest to start an NFL oh. career as a quarterback without ever scrambling. It's over like <laughs> 500 pass attempts now. He has never <laughs> once scrambled. <laughs> that's wow. a good fact. That yeah. is interesting. I mean, to be honest, that's good. When we look at those, those like, I know he's not a rookie, but when we mm. look at the rookie route, ro- uh, quarterbacks that have like undone us over the last like four or five years um as as we all know it's typically the ones that are a little bit more mobile like we had last night with Bryce Young or like we had with, with like even CJ Stroud who isn't necessarily a mobile QB but exploited that against us yeah. um yeah those are the ones we've always struggled against so it's good to know he doesn't yeah well, right. he, he, he might have tried to and just never got to the line of scrimmage but <laughs> <laughs> So, Sam, we'll stay with you then, and we'll think about the other side of the ball. How are the Bucks going to score on the Raiders? For me, it's about getting a little bit more rotation in the running back room as well. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we didn't see much of Sean Tucker last night, and I think it would be great to get him more involved in the game. We didn't see, exactly as Rich said, we didn't see much of Rashad White in the passing game, and I think that would have been great to see. So just a little bit more variety. Obviously, I kind of, I understand because we kind of just stuck with what was working, which was Bucky, <laughs> um, and I've, I've got no issue with that. If, if it works again <laughs> next week, I'm happy for us to stick to it. But yeah, get more of the running back room involved. We've got one of the best running back rooms in the, in the league, in my opinion, and I think we should exploit that. Gary, do you agree? Spread the ball or run with the hot hand? Uh, oh, I think you run with the hot hand to start with, and then you get this fella here going. Mm. Um, you know, feed him the ball. It, it's a classic case of the run setting up the pass. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't think their defence is any great shakes with the exception of Mr Crosby. Um, so, yeah, you ride the hot hand, uh, give it to Bucky, get that O-line 
working like they were working against the Panthers. And then uh, when they're expecting the run, let's uh, get Mikey's thousand yards. And Rich, how are we going to stop Max Crosby then? Hope he takes on Tristan one on one. Yeah, yeah. Keep, <laughs> stay on that uh, side. Stay on that side. Don't go yeah, the other side. I, I, I one of the, I, I know it, it, I would normally against pretty much any other edge rusher, I would say typically run at them so that you wear them down a bit, so that when it does actually come time for them to pass rush, they don't have the energy. But I feel like Max is so good that he'll just he, he'll negate the run himself. Um, that, that worked so, in the fifth quarter again, but otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. He might finally tire. Um, mm. Yeah, I think it's going to be a case of a lot of double teams and running away from him. And I think Baker and Liam Cohen have got to go back to getting the ball out quickly. Um, we've seen it work so well in previous weeks. That, as we as we've said, a little bit head scratching as to why we went away from that this week, but particularly with Baker's ankle, he might not be scrambling around as much. So helping him get the ball out of his hands quickly, I think is going to be a really, really big key for when we do inevitably have to pass it. But yeah, I think that, I don't know if there's an, a way to stop Max Crosby. I think you just merely try to humanise him and slow him down a little bit. And, but but at, the end, at the end of the day, he's only one player, isn't he? And yes, he he's a very good player. Um, and other teams, Hutchinson did it to us, you know, yeah. against the Lions. So you game plan for him, uh, double team him, do whatever you have to do. Yeah. The um, worrying thing is that we did we, we game plan for Hutch and he still got five sacks. Oh well, <laughs> but he was going up against the backup, wasn't yeah, he? He was. He was. So, um, yeah, yeah you, you just game plan him out the way and and run the ball away from him, throw the ball the opposite side, get the ball out quick. You know the the coaches know what to do. They've just got to put the game plan in place to take him out of the game for us. Go on, Sam. What were you going to say? I was going to say a fairer comparison maybe would be how we shut down TJ Watt. I think we mm. made him look human, mm. which is quite impressive. Um, one stat I did see was that we're, of all of the teams, we're the ones that have utilised additional tight ends to block uh, the most in the league this season. Obviously, part of that was because we had injuries to Tristan Wirfs, so we were playing our backups to tackle, so we had to <laughs> deploy extra help. But I think that's something that might help us if Max Crosby does line up on the right tackle rather than the left tackle. I think that's really good. And go on. We, 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 so we say, we, I saw Payne Durham, you know, was getting on the field a fair amount last night. And actually, and Co Keith's been coming on as well. I think we have got a good tight end stable. I, I agree. And I also think that Luke Gedeke is incredibly underrated. Yeah. I think he's, he's, he's unlucky that he's opposite Tristan Wirfs. But yeah. I think he's like the fifth highest graded tackle according to Pro Football Focus this year and might be first in the NFC so yeah. as, as a right or second behind yeah. Lane Johnson, I think it might be. But He's actually having quietly a great season. It's just he's not Tristan Worth, so doesn't get quite the same plaudits. So I don't think it's as much of an issue. It's just the fact that Max is obviously Max. And yeah, if tight ends helping out is certainly no bad thing. We've also got a slightly better guard on the left-hand side than the right, um, statistically. Mm. So I think it's not even just uh, Gedeke. He's, uh, he's having to fight a little bit more. I saw what, there was one last night, wasn't there, where Cody Mork even pushed... Uh, defensive player into the... yeah clown it yeah he was he in fair play to Malk, he's trying to look for extra work but it, yeah. <laughs> it was, so it was the block. yeah not at that moment that's how Cody's he's, he's the he's the second coming of Ryan Jensen with that with that flame red hair running around there's nowhere to hide when you've got that as your hairdo no, I, I was uh, I was sat next to his grandparents at the Giants game and uh, they had the same flaming red hair even at that age so uh, oh fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. I I, I, I just say I really like, like all of our O line. Actually, I think school when he's come in as I, I think he's not been for, for a backup. I think he's he's not not done too badly either. Like we say, the run game historically has been so bad, and yet now we are the first yard we're winning. We're pushing people back, which we've never done for donkeys years. Uh, it's always been fantastic pass protection, but never been able to run the ball. And now we can run the ball. And it isn't just Bucky. I think it is about you know, opening up holes and things for me. Um, I think, Gary, what you said about feeding Evans, I, I kind of think that's potentially a dangerous um, mentality just because it might make us one-dimensional. Um, Sam, what do you think in terms of like spreading the ball around? And, and obviously we talked about the, the running back, but for the receiver stable. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's it's really hard because I'm I'm so <laughs> internally conflicted because I want nothing more than for Mike Evans to get his 1,000 yards. Absolutely. Short of making the playoffs, that's the next I, most important thing. I would, really, argue really that, is. Like, I would argue. I would argue. I'd rather us 
him get the 1k than us make the playoffs mm. at this point mm. because I don't mm. think we're going to do a lot in the playoffs so let's keep that mm. streak alive <laughs> I was so glad that like that was the one consoling thing mm. when we was like oh no we got overtime oh more chance for Mike <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah so my, my dream scenario would be that he we win comfortably but he gets like 200 yards a couple of touchdowns that'd be great I think what we could do, Gary, is is he could be the deep threat. Now, I know he's not necessarily a speedster, but he's so good at using his body. And, you know, like I say, if we can get that an extra defender up into the box because they're worried about Tucker up the middle or someone's having to shadow um, White when he's going out for what looks like it could be a screen or a swing pass or something like that, that's when I think we can hit Mike Evans when he's one-on-one -on -one in lots of space with the safety looking the other way or something like that. Yeah. Um, okay, but so... It, I mean, yeah. he is double teamed a lot though isn't he so you know that always frees up theoretically <laughs> you know one of the other guys um but you know i i i agree with the other the other two guys um we need he he's got a monster game in him he always has one yeah. massive game a year doesn't he you know 180 yards or something like that Too and i can see it being this week you know he's uh, the um I can't even think who we played last year. He got last week. He got sixty odd yards on his first game back. Giants, Giants, yeah. wasn't it? Um, was he just feeling it out? Was he just not, you know, hundred percent sure it was okay? But you know, one hundred eighteen yards he got against uh, the Panthers. So I can see him going off and having a monster game. One thing they said that. Sorry, Sam. You, you go. And one one thing that they did say before the Giants game, and they said a little bit before the Panthers, that they don't want him running down the field so much to mm. to save his hamstring. So I like it, obviously we want to see the deep shot to Mike, but I feel like it, it he definitely looked more like Mike Evans this week than he did the week before. Like he Absolutely. he was he was opening up a little bit more, and you could see like the burst is coming back a little bit. So I hope hopefully it will be this week, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're still just just holding him back. Just You're right. To... We don't want him to swing it again. But let's be honest, there's no reason for him to be practicing other anything other than an exercise bike and a stretch. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, he can sunbathe on the sideline. Yeah. Uh, and not even one... the bike, just the stretch. <laughs> yeah. I saw he's, he, since entering the league, he's drawn the most pass interference flags of all wide receivers. And he's just, so that's the thing for me is like, use the running backs to get us close to the goal line and then just... Mm. That back corner fade to Mike, so he's either going to catch the ball brilliantly like he did last night, or he'll draw a flag. So or the slant. He's still him and Godwin both run the slant so well. It's a criminally yeah. underused play, I think, by us because it's such a high percentage pass when it's thrown properly. But I'd love to that. I've, so, I've got go another. On. I've got one more stat for you. Oh, Kieran. go on then. Go on, Sam. J just because you said about the the pass interference, it's not just yeah. since Mike Evans came into the league. He actually ever. has the most. Yeah, the most ever. He's ever. over eight hundred and seventy yards now of pass interferences against him. He overtook Randy Moss against the Giants. Wow. Right, we need to get him we need to get him a Pro Bowl career in DPIs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> add it onto his add it onto his yardage. He'll be over a thousand easily. Well, it's annoying yeah. that he doesn't get them, isn't it? You know, can, you, can, can we decline it? Decline it. Did he catch it? <laughs> cool. Okay, so it's make your mind up time. It's score predictions. Um Rich, I know while you're thinking, okay, I'll give you a bit more so a bit longer. Sam, what's the score gonna look like when the clock ticks down and why? Uh, I I think um, just based on the the kind of two face of the Bucks that we've seen this season, where one week we turn up and we're brilliant, one week we turn up and we're a shadow of our former selves. I'm but just banking on the fact that we will flip to the other and we'll be brilliant, and it will be a, an absolute washout. Um, I think they'll score. I'm hoping it's a garbage time TD, um, and I'll give them one field goal, so they'll have ten points. And I'm just going to go wild and say we'll get thirty five. Why not? So nice. Right. So, uh, Dr. Todd and Mr. Bowles, uh, the two faces of the Buccaneers. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rich, your score prediction? I'm going to go 33-26. I think it's going to be... I, I, Having seen the... I mean, the how the Raiders didn't beat the Chiefs in the end on Friday, I, I will never know. But um, I, I do think we're going to struggle on defence again, particularly if we don't have Mike Edwards. And obviously, KJ Britt's doubtful. I know KJ's not been great, but it didn't look like JJ Russell did much either. So I struggle to see us slowing down the Raiders when they need to start passing. Um, but I do think that another game with Mike getting in rhythm, hopefully Bucky's OK, maybe Sean Tucker gets involved again. I don't think they'll have enough to stop our offence. That once, once they get rolling, Baker will bounce back, et cetera, et cetera. I think we'll have too much for them. 
Cool. And then Gary, obviously, we know no one predicts, predicts Bucks losses. You're, I'm sure you're not going to become the lone wolf here. Uh, no, I'm not. So I'm I'm with Sam in uh, hoping that we get a bounce back. Uh, as we, we did earlier in the season, the horrible against the Broncos, brilliant the following week against the Eagles. So I'm hoping the same thing happens. Um, we are fairly consistent on offence around about the 30-point mark. Um, we're at home. They're travelling across the country. They're in a different time zone, so I'm hoping that affects them. But, you know, generally... And it's an it early game, very unusually for a yeah, Raiders game, isn't it? So. Indeed, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm hoping it affects them, but mm. but it probably won't. They are professionals at that, after all. So I'm going around about the 30 points. So I'm going to say 33 as well, along with Rich. Um, I'm hoping the defence plays a little bit better, but I can see them getting somewhere in the region of 17. So I'm going to go but 33-17. Oh, interesting. And I, I think it's going to be a shootout. I think whoever has the ball last will win. I think the Bucks. Yeah, I've written down 31-28. Um, I think, you know, I think we will move the ball, but I, I just, I'm not sure what our answer is at the moment for, for covering tight ends, for generating pressure that actually gets the quarterback on the ground. Um, I think, you know, I also, I think sometimes we look tired as well. I think, you know, there's, there's long drives now. And when when we can have long drives, I think it really pays dividends. But sometimes we actually had some short drives, and I think, yeah, I see the D looking a bit tired. So I hope I'm wrong. As in, other than us winning, obviously, I hope I'm right about that. But um, yeah, let's, we always like it when it's uh, nice. We haven't had many this season, probably only one or two, where actually you can take a breather and relax in the fourth quarter. I think as well, I, for some weird reason, I've just got a feeling that there's going to be a defensive touchdown. I think they're going to potentially Ooh. bounce back and respond to some of the criticism of not playing so well. We haven't had a pick six in a while. We haven't had a fumble return in a while. So I've just got a weird feeling with Aidan O'Connell um, maybe backed up against his goal line, might throw a little pick six. That's my point. When, when was our last interception? Was it Spencer Rattler against the Saints? My memory's not that good. Yeah, might, might well be. It does feel like a long time ago. Mm. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't recall one recently. Let's put it that way. Mm. But I hope you're right, Sam. I really hope you're yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you guys for watching. Uh, let us know in the comments if you think we're completely barking or not. Uh, it can't be as bad as when the entire UK San Francisco 49ers community has descended upon us. Uh, but we, uh, let's tend Providence and see how we go. Uh, I, I can give up postal addresses for a fee. Don't worry. Um, so thank you, Gary. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, guys. We will see you next time as ever. And as usual, go Bucks. Go Bucks. Go Bucks. Go Bucks.